Hello, and welcome to a webinar from the Alaska chapter of the Association for Learning Environments. Today we are very happy to provide you with, the seven, with this webinar of the Fundamentals of Recovered Heat in Rural Alaska, presented by Tracy McEwen of CRW Engineers. Before we start the webinar, I want to first uh, recognize our annual sponsors. Uh, with our gold sponsors for this year, as well as our silver and uh, bronze sponsors. Without their help, we would not be able to do these webinars. So we appreciate um, all of our sponsors and our ability to give this information out to the rest of Alaska, uh, and also Canada and the rest of the world. So if you have ideas on how on other seminars and webinars that we should have, that particularly interest the Arctic and remote communities, please let the Alaska chapter of the Association for Learning Environments, A4LE, let us know and we will get one out there. Without further ado, I will pass this over to Tracy and let her start the presentation. Hello everyone, thank you for coming today. Um, this presentation is on heat recovery in rural Alaska. And so, you know, we have some kind of, a couple of goals today are going to be to, one, explain heat recovery to those who maybe don't know exactly what that is. Um, we'll talk about some of the benefits of heat recovery, technologies and uses. Um, we'll look at some of the design considerations if you choose to maybe possibly want to implement a heat recovery system and don't currently have one. And how that may impact your maintenance and some considerations for that as well. And we'll talk about some lessons learned on some previous projects. Um, over the course of the last few years while I've been doing heat recovery. So what is heat recovery? You know, heat recovery, there's probably a hundred different definitions out there, um, but it really, you know, the essentially heat recovery is when, um, you know, using any heat that would otherwise be wasted to the environment and we find a new use for it. Um, heat recovery is really a secondary source of heat. It's not a primary. So you wouldn't want necessarily heat recovery to replace your boilers, for instance, in a building. Um, but the other key thing is to understand that, you know, waste heat is about saving energy, about saving fuel. It's not actually about heating. So you know what heat recovery is, now what? You know, what, what are we going to do with it? Um, space heating is the single, the single largest energy end use in most buildings. In rural Alaska communities, we find that the add heat process to water and sanitary sewer systems is also a large and costly consumer, um, costly to consumers of energy. So, you know, if we can find a way to heat our buildings, heat the water, deal with those process heat scenarios, we're going to be able to save fuel and money. So what are some of those users who, who might consider using this? We're going to look for high energy use buildings and communities that um, they're going to be our best recipients of recovered heat. So schools, water treatment plants, and clinics are typically the largest consumers of energy in most of our rural communities. Um, we also have things like um, washeterias where even you know, today a lot of our dryers use hydronic coils and have a huge demand for heat even in the summer. In addition to the users and uses, you know, it's kind of important to point out the fact that heat recovery is not new. There are a lot of existing technologies. Um, there are several mediums within a building that waste heat can be recovered from. You know, you can recover waste heat from air, water, or refrigerant. So, you know, we'll see heat recovery ventilators. Um, in our generators and power plants, a lot of times we have fuel and stack exhaust recovery. We have heat pump technologies that are out there, and we can even do heat reclaim recovery off of chillers. These are just a few of the you know, different technologies that exist today. We really don't have time to cover them all today. Um, to do that, I mean, I could do a, we could do a webinar on each of those heat recoveries in general, and that's probably not going to work. <laughs> We don't have that much time. So today, you know, we're going to focus really on heat recovery from generators and diesel generators, specifically in Alaska, because that's where most of our rural energy, rural Alaska gets their electricity from. 
Um, they're an untapped resource in many of our communities. Um, we have two choices of recovery for diesel generators. That's cooling jacket water and exhaust stacks. Um, exhaust stacks, I'm not really going to cover. They're gaining ground in Alaska, but we don't use them necessarily as often. Um, and so we're going to focus today primarily on cooling jacket water savings. So how do you harness waste heat in rural Alaska? I mean, this schematic is kind of going to give you a general idea of what we might do for that. Um, the schematic shows the equipment and the parts of heat recovery systems. Um, we utilize heat exchangers to isolate those systems. Um, we can use pump nodes and control valves and thermostatic control to control things like um, freezing or back feeding. So waste heat in rural Alaska starts at a power plant. In, you know, in this case, we're going to start at the power plant, whatever the local utility is. And off their generators, they're going to have the ability to recover heat from those generators. Um, since power plants tend to use ethylene glycol, in their generators, and that's not safe to send to our community. Um, we would use a heat exchanger to isolate the system and develop a heat recovery loop. This heat recovery loop can be above ground, below ground piping that would then feed heated water out to our buildings where we would then supplement the heat in our existing hydronic heating system um, and or provide heat in a building that doesn't necessarily already have a source of heating through the use of the heat exchangers and the pump nodes and the thermostatic valves. Um, so that's the basics. But what are the things to consider? What do we want to really know about heat recovery? Well, in rural Alaska, right now there's 74 Alaska communities using recovered heat from power plants, diesel generators to heat buildings. Um, we know that the Alaska Energy Authority has a heat recovery program and it's working within 60 communities to either expand those existing systems or install heat recovery. Like I said, it's not new, but it is an untapped source that can be very beneficial. If you're considering looking into heat recovery, one of the first things you have to do is think about how we're going to fund that. What are some of the, you know, do you have the money to do that alone? Um, if not, there are funding opportunities available for things um, for this type of system. Um, both the Alaska Energy Authority, they have Renewable Energy Grant Fund, uh, Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, Denali Commissioning. There's federal funding available through the EPA, USDA, Department of Energy, and even loan programs. So there are a lot of untapped resources, and if you are considering it, these are some of the resources you can go to to help kind of find out how you would fund this this, ex this journey, I guess. Um, so, you know, you know how you might fund it, you know what it is, but it isn't feasible to install. Um, the problem is, is before you start, you need to know a little bit about what you're actually planning on doing. So one, who owns the generator? What condition are they in? You know, do you know what building you want to supply and how that building is heated? Um, is there a reasonable path? Is it a short distance, a long distance in the same building? Um, how are you going to get from the source of heat to the building you want to heat or the system you want to maintain? Who's going to maintain the system? You know, who's maintaining the power plant? Who's maintaining your own facility? Um, you know, do you want monitoring? Are you going to want to know how many BTUs or how much fuel you're saving? Does it matter, you know, in relation to cost? Um, and who's going to fund the project? These are some really important things to talk about and consider before you actually go down this road. So a cost-benefit analysis is something that um, you really want to look at a little bit. Um, the fact is, is that when you're installing one of these heat recovery systems above grade, it's kind of important to remember that to install a mile of pipe, you're looking at $750,000 to a million dollars sometimes. So if you're too far away, um, it might not be cost effective to look at it. 
So what are some of the things we need to consider when we do a cost-benefit analysis? Well, we might look at usable and available heat. Um, the cost of fuel in the community the amount of, and the amount of fuel historically consumed. It's also important to consider, you know, what is, you know, what's the fuel trend going on? Is it, you know, are we getting more expensive, less expensive? Typically fuel is just growing in cost anyway. Um, and including the logistics of fuel. You know, how is it getting to your community? How does it get there? How often is it delivered? Um, you know, we need to consider the cost of construction, the cost of operation and maintenance, and, you know, the possibility that you may have to put in a heat sales agreement. Heat sales agreement is where you're going to actually pay a certain portion of the cost of the fuel and the savings back to the power plant um, for what you're getting from them. Typically, it re it's probably about 40 to 60 percent of what you're, you're saving, your 40 percent is what you're paying back in. Um, are there any anticipated future changes to your building that may change the amount of heat you're using or the amount of heat that may be available at the power plant? And what's the proximity of the heating source? The idea here is to actually figure out what's your return on investment. You know, if this is going to, if you go and install the system and it takes you 60 years to get a payback, it's probably not worth doing. We really like to see, you know, five to ten years. Um, the systems are typically designed for, you know, 15 to 20 years, um, and so you want a 5 to 10 year payback before you dive in. So what about your building heating system? You know, we typically we either have hydronic heating or forced air in most of our community buildings. Um, hydronic heating, if we're going to be using cooling jacket water, we're bringing it over. Hydronic heating is a much easier tie-in than possibly forced air. Um, what temperatures does the system operate? It's really important to consider holistically what your building heating system is. If we don't, if you don't know what, how your system is being operated, you don't know if the heat available is even going to be something you can take advantage of. So when we look at heating, um, you know, our, typically we can pull 190, 195 degrees water from our generators and deliver those to a building. Um, if your building's operating at 180, 160, then the higher temps you can dump, you can actually include that into your system and take advantage of it. But if you're going to a washeteria where you might, they might be putting their building out at 200, 195, 200, maybe you're not getting any advantage for this. It really does play into you know how your building is. So you know, look at your building system. How is it controlled? Do you even have power available? Um, is there space to install additional equipment that will be required? And again, over and over, who maintains it? Whoever maintains it needs to understand the systems to make sure that they're going to be worthwhile. So what's, you know, in addition to our building, we also have to look at our source, and that's going to be your power plant. Um, based on the generator loads, you can kind of determine, and the community uses, you can de determine the amount of heat available. You know, when those peak demand loads for the community or service, um, you're going to look at the generators. You're going to look at the existing heat recovery system if it does exist. Are there stacked cooling jacket water? Is there additional heat available? Um, what are the conditions of the generators? And if you know heating recovery doesn't exist, what are the modifications you're going to be required to make in the system, and what are they going to cost you to bring to collect the waste heat? Um, it's also important to kind of have a brief understanding of what AMOT valves are, and um, that's how a lot of our power plants control their generators and the amount of heat. So generators and stacks, you know, the one thing we know, diesel generators are inefficient. <laughs> you know, the old rules of technology was a third of the, elect you know, a third of the energy went to creating electricity, a third went to the radiators and out the building, and a third went up the stack. So diesel generators weren't efficient. Um, but technology nowadays, we have the technology to change those rules. Um, we can collect jacket water heating recovery. Um, we can do exhaust stack recovery. And we can even install marine manifolds on our cooling jackets. And those allow us to recover a lot more heat than we had. Um, previously. So
So marine manifolds, just as a kind of a knowledge, they can be installed after, so on, they can retrofit onto an existing generator. Um, and depending on the loads in the generator, you, they can actually provide 5 to 25 percent increase available to the waste heat. So depending on the generator loads and the make and model, um, it may be worth considering installing a marine jacket if it's available. Um, typically they're around $30,000 to install. Some of the bigger generators, that number jumps up to closer to 50000 so what are AMOT valves? <laughs> AMOT valves are thermostatic control valves. They're, most of our power, they can either be electronic, they can be manual. Typically, they're reliable and they provide an automatic temperature control. Um, it's important to understand whether the generator is utilizing, if, whether the, if the AMOT valve is installed, is, kind of important to understand how it's being operated, whether it's being utilized as a mixing and or diverting option. Depending on how it's operating, what can happen is when the cooling temperatures start to go up or down, sometimes the velocity in the system is reduced. And in doing that, um, you would affect the amount of waste heat available um, to send out to your system is if the velocity of the lines are changing. So it's important to understand how those are being used to control the cooling temperatures in the generator and the fact that they, can all, they also tend to leak by sometimes. So if you're looking for a high quality of heat, when I say quality of heat, if you're looking to have 190, 195 degrees heat sent out because of the building you're serving, you may want to consider either replacing and or retrofitting an existing valve to make sure that it doesn't bleed by so you can get a better quality of heat. And in that is, again, a costly adventure here. There's another $5,000 to replace, you know, five to $8,000 to replace these valves, depending on whether you go electronic or not. Um, so the quality of heat that you need, again, that goes right back to knowing you know, where are you going to be supplying heat to and what's your building doing, what are your systems doing, it all kind of works together. You've got to have a holistic picture of this before you jump into waste heat. So what are some of the parts and pieces? What are the things that we need to use and consider and have some knowledge about? The first thing are our piping options. Um, traditionally, you know, waste heat systems, like I said, they're not new. They've been around a long time. And traditionally, we used steel pipe and insulated it, or we put um, PEX in the building. Both of these have their limitations. Um, steel piping, while it lasts forever, um, basically, and you know, maybe not forever, but close. Uh, <laughs> it's heavy. It's costly to ship. It's costly to install, and logistically, it's difficult to get in and out of the community. Um, PEX, it, it's great, it's cheaper to install, you can do longer runs without joints in it, you can bury it, but it has temperature limitations. You know, anything above 180 and you start, you know, you, you worry about the integrity of the piping system itself. So depending on the quality and the amount of heat you're trying to get, PEX may not be the right option for your system. Also the insulated PEX systems tend to um, have a higher, have less insulation on them, so higher heat loss and higher loss of heat through the system. So what are some alternate solutions? Well, we can always use polypropylene random phaser composite pipe and a random copolymer with modified crystalline and temperature resistance, PPR, PPR, CT. Um, the ideal thing with both of these solutions or both of these alternate types of pipe is they can be installed similar to what we do with Arctic piping. We can put insulation around them and install them as an Arctic grade type pipe. They also run higher temperatures. PPR can tend to run up to about 190 and um, without affecting the integrity or the lifetime of the piping system. And PPR CT can actually go upwards of 200 degrees without again affecting the lifetime and or the warranty on the pipe. So you can get better quality heat through them. Um, so um, 
On top of that, they have a longer war uh, PPR and PPRCT. Um, they can be used above grade or below grade. They have longer warranties on them. So, you know, ideally now, you know, your choice is PPR, PPRCT, PEX piping, depending on the installation and where you're going. Both these are low cost alternatives that could be installed in lieu of possibly a steel pipe. So what else do you need to know? Um, we're talking about some heating solution mediums. Um, ethylene glycol is what we see in a lot of our generators. This is not safe for uh, human consumption, animals, kids, so it's not something that AEDC is going to ADEC is going to let us run through our communities. Um, propylene glycol and water can both be on the end user side of a heat recovery system. Um, propylene glycol, you're going to get a burst protection for your piping that you wouldn't have necessarily with water. So in the event that it freezes, it's a better protection, but you lose some heat transfer qualities with propylene versus the water. Um, depending on your system, either one of these may, you know, either of these may be an option, and you can almost always expect ethylene is going to be on the generator side. Heat exchanger. There are a lot of choices for heat exchanger, whether they're brace plate, plate and frame, shell and tube, tube and tube. Um, and in many cases in the past, we saw shell and tube and tube and tube heat exchangers used. Um, but because of the low maintenance um, and the fact that a lot of our heat recovery systems are low GPMs, the brace plate heat exchangers um, have become a better option. They take up less space. They can be mounted in a lot, you know, just about anywhere. Um, and so we've taken to using them more often in some of our recent, more recent heat recovery systems. You have to be a little careful when you're looking at the, uh, going into potable water systems, maybe tying into water treatment or water, add water, add heat to water systems, because they do have limited double wall options. And so if you're looking at a large VTU, you may go to a plate and frame heat exchanger in those instances. But both the, the plate and frame also allows you, you know, an easy, both of them are better maintenance and uh, require less space for clearance and maintenance in a shell and tube. So pumps versus valves. Um, you know, the other kind of key point when you go back to that uh, schematic we were looking at is that you have to have a way to control the heat recovery system and so we can do this through pumps and valves. Um, constant volume pumps are one option. They're familiar to operators. They're less expensive to purchase initially. Um, but they don't always, you know, they're, and, and in some cases they're the right option, especially if there's additional pieces, you know, additional pumps and spares available in the community. Um, variable frequency drive pumps allow us, you know, in many instances there's dry run protection built in so we can avoid flow switches and pressure switches in the system and uh, potential false, uh, false alarms. Um, they provide an energy savings. They may be a little more costly up front, but they can also be um, beneficial. And then alternately, there's always control valves. So you can use three-way control valves to tie the, you know, the heating into your existing system. Controls. Controls are historically the biggest problem with waste heat systems or recovery heat systems. Um, the problem is, is that they tend to be essentially over complex or they're typically oversimplified or absolutely no control at all on the system. And without control, you risk backfeeding. Essentially what that means is you don't want your building heating the power plant, um, drawing, you know, sending heat back to the generators and the radiators. You want heat to come to your building, but if they're not controlled properly, you can backfeed on the system. So what's the goal of the system? When designing control systems, it's important to know what your final goal is, and this is where it's important to talk to your operators, your maintenance facility operators, 
talk to your owner, find out what their rear, real goal for the system is. Are they looking for something that's operator friendly, something that's simplified? Or are they looking for the most energy efficient system possible for their facility? Um, you know, th they do provide distinct differences. Um, so knowing what you're looking for and what your goal of the system is is important. Um, operator friendly systems, you can do off the shelf single loop controllers. Um, you know, you can put in simplified controls so each stage has its own controller. Um, each system has its own controller. Energy savings, you know, but what you give up is energy savings for the ease of maintenance sometimes. More energy efficient systems can sometimes involve slightly more complex controls. Um, they typically require increased monitoring to, of the systems. Um, there's an increased upfront cost, but you see an overall lifetime increased energy savings as well on these systems. So what does simple controls really mean? Um, it, for us, it's been an out-of-the-box approach. Um, we've taken this and we've done standalone single loop electronic controllers. Um, we use them to monitor temperatures in the building's end user system. We use them to monitor the common heat recovery loop from the power plant so that we can see where's the heat. You know, we need to have more heat in our heat recovery loop than we do in the building system, otherwise we're going to backseat. Um, these single you know, loop electronic controllers, they can enable and disable pumps and valves and even some of them come with high temp alarms on them. BTU meters are also required and they can measure the thermal energy transfer to the end user for the heat recovery system. Essentially, you know how much you're saving. You know, what, what's the benefit you're seeing from the system if you've got, if you put BTU meters in? What are some of the typical notifications and alarms we see? Well, we look for notifications of our control functions. Um, and these can be visual or audible or both. Um, many of our, um, many of our owners want a visual alarm that lets their operators know something's wrong so they can go investigate it or an audible alarm that can be shut off to make sure that they realize it's a priority. Um, sometimes we actually have those alarms also control functions like turn pumps off and on. Sometimes they just alarm. Um, it really depends on the owner. We can go either way. Uh, some of the typical alarms we see in these systems and that could be of importance depending on where the system is is pressure, high temperature, low temp, and then flow and no flow of course. And that's for your pumps. So now you know what it is. What are the parts and pieces? So let's look at one of the systems that, I've, that we've recently installed here, which was the Quinnahawk Heat Recovery System. This project's primary focus, you know, we talked about the goal. The goal is to add heat to the community water distribution loops because they've had a serious problem with freeze-ups in the community and to um, utilize the add heat for operating the hydronic dryers of the community washacheria. Um, they were, those hydronic dryers are very costly for fuel. So to make heating, you know, the project goals were to make the heating systems more efficient, to reduce the impact of the increasing fuel oil costs, but it was really important to the community that, and the end users that it be a simple, effective, and efficient design for operation. So the plan was to capture, recover the unused heat from the diesel generators, um, from the cooling jacket water at the AVAC power plant and distribute it through an above ground piping system in this case to heat the washacheria and the utility building which held the water treatment. Uh, they had a very limited budget, $756,000 and that was to include construction management labor and material. We had a design and planning budget of just right around $64,000 so overall, the entire system was to be developed, installed for under a million dollars, $820,000. This system was a collaborative effort. When we talk about knowing you know, your systems and knowing your community, um, the design and construction team who got involved in this quickly realized that there were a lot of people that had to be brought into this system to make sure we could meet all our project goals. We dealt with ANTHC, who was our client at the time, 
and who, you know, kind of got us down this path. And then we realized that, you know, the Washeteer was owned by the native village of Quinnahawk. The city of Quinnahawk owned the utility building, so we had two different owners involved in this that wanted to take um, part in this system. We had AREC who was doing the operations and maintenance. And then, of course, we had to also keep in mind AVAC, the local utility, was that we were going to have to have close collaboration with them. In addition to that, the original funding that was put out by AEA was not sufficient to actually construct the project. And so additional funding sources were sought as part of this project to help get the, this installed in the community. And EPA was approached for that. So what were the challenges? What were the actual challenges of installing, installing the system? Funding, that was the first. Also ground conditions. Um, you know, we couldn't bury pipe out here. We had to use helicals, um, pipe supports. It was an above grade system. Helicals are costly. So ground conditions, site control. You know, how are we going to get the pipe from AVAC? Whose property were we going to cross? Who did we have to get easements from? Um, the heat recovery systems control. They wanted them simple. They wanted them effective. We still had to do monitoring. So that was a challenge. Um, subsistence schedules. This community is a subsistence community. So we had to work around hunting season, fishing season. Um, all of those subsistence type schedules impacted our labor for construction. Um, lack of available power. While there was plenty of power at the utility building, the Washeteria itself had almost no power available to install a system in. So how are we going to serve a building we couldn't even get power from? And in addition to that, there was almost no space at the Washeteria for installing any equipment. So it was a challenge to figure out how we were going to get these systems installed. So what did we do? I said we went to AEA and EPA. We did that. Um, we were able to work with those because we were also, there was also construction of a uh, water and sewer project going on in the community, and EPA realized there was a benefit to having this heat recovery system in to serve that, we were able to get additional funding. So you have to be creative sometimes in your funding sources. Um, the coordination within the community, different, dealing with different entities, making sure everybody was happy, knowing we had an outside operator coming in. We also had to deal with the operators for AVAC versus each of the individual buildings which were operated. And, um, we had different maintenance and operations for different systems. Um, we couldn't afford steel pipe. Couldn't afford steel pipe, couldn't afford the cost to get it out to the community and use it. And so, and PEX pipe, because we were serving a washeteria that had 200 degree water at it, I, I struggled, you know, we struggled with the fact that, you know, PEX pipe just wasn't going to be, going to give me the quality heat I needed out to the washeteria. Um, so we came up with alternate piping sources. We used out-of-the-box controllers. We kept to those single loop simple controls. And to reduce cost of construction, we were able to share resources for the projects with other ongoing construction projects in the community. And some of the innovative designing with the piping and how we installed that piping also came into play. So what was the outcome? Well, the outcome was a design that was able to be used as a prototype in other communities. This project reduced the sh fuel shortfalls in this community. It provided the community with actually a surplus of fuel. And when I say that, you have to understand, in the first month of operation, the utility building used less than 10 gallons of fuel. That 10 gallons of fuel was used primarily for testing fire pumps and generators. Um, historically, this building used 17,000 gallons a month before that. In the first year of operation, after the heat sales agreement with AVAC, the community recognized $46,000 in savings. And because of the, low, the, the minimized fuel usage, they actually didn't order fuel for this building the following year. So what else does it do? Well, beyond that, they were able to reduce their carbon footprint. It boosted the local economy by keeping laborers actively employed in the facility. It actually increased the economic viability of their water and sewer system. By being able to provide ad heat without the additional fuel cost to do that, 
um, they were able to, re to increase the long-term sustainability of the facilities as well. Um, they aren't using the boiler. You know, the boilers don't have to fire as often. The boilers that were starting to reach the end of their life, we've extended the life of those facilities as well and those, that equipment. Um, we added redundancy, which is key in these kind of communities. So if for any reason their, build, their boilers do fail, they have an additional building heating supply system so, or source for heating the buildings. Um, they have the ability to add water to their distribution loops and collection mains. It prevents costly freeze-ups as well as the labor and repair costs to go and fix those issues from before. So it actually made their pipe, water, and sewer system more affordable for the entire community. So you've seen it work. We know it's been successful. We know it's installed in several communities already and we're looking to expand those expansions. But what does that mean to the end user? I mean, the question is, is, you know, once you get this system in, you know, are you going to spend more money maintaining it? Not really. Um, you know, daily maintenance is actually pretty simple in this, in this regard. You know, we're going to want to keep a daily log that allows you to verify temperatures in and out of the system. Um, it allows you to check the BTU rate, pump flow. And you're going to do some visual inspections. Nothing you wouldn't do on maybe your own existing hydronic system as it sends right now. Your maintenance guy is probably walking through looking to see if there's a leak. And he's probably checking temperatures on the heating or the hot or cold water in the building as it stands right now. These simple daily logs and daily maintenance allow you to identify a problem before it gets out of hand or before it costs you money. And it allows you to be able to talk with the engineer and or another operator in the event something goes wrong and have something to identify what might be going on. So quarterly maintenance, I mean for a heat, ex you're adding a heat exchanger to the building. So you might want to do a visual inspection, you know, make sure that the insulation is, you know, intact. It doesn't always stay that way. <laughs> you can check the pressure drop at the heat exchanger and strainer, see if it needs to be cleaned. Um, you're going to check your safety relief valve on it and see if it's going off. Um, you're going to check the pressure gauges and thermometers and make sure they're in the right. I mean, all of this is standard maintenance stuff you would do for other items in your system. It's not going to add a lot of time to your operators. If you're using a braze plate heat exchanger, you've really got minimal to no maintenance outside of those visual checks. Um, if you have a plate and frame heat exchanger installed, you might want to confirm the units are tightened. You know, make sure that there's no leak, gaskets are tight, everything's in place. That's it. Pumps and valves, you already have them in your system. This, the changes here are no different. You're just going to check pressure drops at strainers. You might want to verify your VFD operations is operating as it's supposed to be. You might want to inspect the pump field. You might want to cycle and verify your control valves are operating. Um, <coughs> the maintenance is pretty straightforward annually. Again, things that you would do it you should be doing normally anyway. Test your glycol system. You can test the glycol in this system like you would your standard heating system. You might check the levels in your makeup tanks, make sure you're not using an excessive amount of glycol for makeup that could indicate there's a leak somewhere in the system. You can check your air pressure at your expansion tanks. Check insulation on the lines. And if you're running a below grade or an exterior piping above grade even um, you're probably going to walk that line. Look for any leaks or breaks in insulation that might have occurred over the course of the year that might need to be repaired. And I tend to re recommend that you flush your heat exchangers with just a mild solution every four or five years anyway, just to prevent buildup and scale. Um, the biggest thing to consider is recommissioning the controls. You know, annually taking the time to go back and just make sure the system is operating the way it's intended. Um, it, it'll save, it'll can make sure that the system is continuing to save you money over the course of the, or the course of the lifetime of the system. Um, an energy management program in place that allows you to look and see what you have been saving versus what you are now. It allows you to establish a baseline and benchmark for your system. So you know if something's going wrong. It also allows you to evaluate the performance feedback, 
performance and the feedback from the system. And you can actually demonstrate your energy to your end users or anybody else who may need to see that, you know, we put the money forward for this system. Is it actually working? Yes, it is. And here's what we're seeing, you know, this is what, what's happening. So recommissioning your controls allows you to, one, with some kind of management program in place, allows you to, one, make sure the system continues to operate the way it was intended to and to show your, fee, your um, payback. So the benefits of heat recovery. What are the benefits of heat recovery? Um, reducing fuel shortfalls, community carbon footprint, it boosts local economy, it can improve long-term sustainability of facilities. And we have an, an added redundancy to building heating systems, knowing that, you know, if your boiler or your heating system fails in rural Alaska, you have an alternate system that could keep other substantial damage from happening in that building, in that facility. Lessons learned. You know, over and over I've done these systems and it's most, the most important thing to know is to know your building heating system. Know where you're going to be installing the waste heat. Know how it's operated, who's operating it, you know, what quality of heat do you really need. Um, you know, who's going to be maintaining these systems and making sure they're trained and they understand the systems and that there's an operation and maintenance manual that can be passed down and forward whether you, you're documenting those trainings. You know, videos are great, but if not, flip charts. Something easy and simple for people to understand and train anybody else who might come in after the fact. Um, you got to pay attention to who the stakeholders are because their priorities may not, may differ from stakeholder to stakeholder, especially if you have multiple end users being served by one system. Um, you should also know the cost to construct and operate the system and how you're planning on monitoring it. Any questions? Well, thank you, Tracy. Uh, we appreciate you for providing this webinar. This particular one uh, that we are doing, uh, we are pre-recording this one, so there's no live uh, questions on this particular one. Uh, but on other webinars that you'll see on our website, there will be live questions. So, again, we appreciate uh, Tracy's time and CRW's uh, time in uh, letting us borrow Tracy to provide this webinar. If you have questions, uh, Tracy's uh, contact information is provided there on the screen. Uh, feel free to reach out to her. And then also, again, uh, Association for Learning Environments, uh, the Alaska chapter, a4le.org, our website is available on there, and you can get in touch with us there. Uh, until next time, thank you very much, and we will talk with you later. Thanks.